Thank you very much. So uh, for the next 45 to 60 minutes, I'll uh, lead you through my journey of building a Jasper tool. I started quite early in 2006. Um, and yeah, 13 years later, we ended up with something. Um, but a little bit about that later. So a little bit first about myself. My name is Barry Cherish. I'm the Jasper lead of Eddie. And that will be of a uh, different, different Norwegian company um, that develops chatbot software or chat tool with chatbot included uh, that connects students in the first year. Um, if you would like to contact me, one of these um, websites, you will find my data. And I'm happy to answer questions. So, quick question up front Who of you knows what a chatbot is? Raise your hand. Okay, that's great. So, how about a conversation interface? Raise your hand if you know what that is. Alright. How about a virtual agent? Raise your hand. Okay. Trick question because it's all the same. <laughs> so one thing that I had really to fight with in the beginning was figuring out what is what and what's the difference. So what do you think, how many different possible names a chatbot, virtual agent, conversational interface could have? So I'll, I'll call for categories and then we raise the hand for, for those who believe it is. Okay, who believes it's around 50? Who believes it's around 80? Who believes it's around 120? Or who believes it's 160 or more? So let's start with the 50s. No. How about 80s? How about 120? All right, 160 or more? All right, the last one, got it right. It's over 160, and that's actually from 2006, so I assume by now many, many more names. If you're curious what it is, well, that is a part of the list. Continues like this, or like this. <laughs> so if you look it up, just Google chatbot synonyms, you will figure out a lot of different names. Some of them are not popular at all anymore. Some of them are common use. But it's really all the same. It's just a different perspective on what part of the chatbot you are framing or what is sort of the thing you're looking at. But in the end, it's always communicating with a computer the same way like humans communicate with each other. So that's the first lesson I had to learn. Understand what's the difference between things and the different names that actually is the very same thing. It's not just chatbots. It's technological and very many other areas people tend to come up with new names to be uh, great or awesome or feel like they invented something new. But if you look at it, it's pretty much the same like something else, but it's just uncool to call it the same way. That's why I just come up with a new name and all of a sudden new thing. So that's the first thing. So back in 2006, um, I was interested in computer science, I was interested in communications, and then I thought, okay, but what, what is sort of the, the area that both combines? And I was like, okay, yeah, chatbots, so communicating with a, with a computer in natural human language. That's the thing I want to do. Um, but I had no idea. I knew a little bit of programming and, you know, typical things you, you learn in the beginning, but uh, no idea whatsoever. So, how do you start? Well, artificial intelligence, that's the answer, right? So I could probably have an own talk about what artificial intelligence is or not is. Uh, just quickly said, no matter who you ask, everybody will tell you something different. This is, there is no defined term what it is or what it not is. Um, it's sort of, if you ask movie makers, if you ask people from deep learning, if you ask user interface people, everybody has a different perspective. There is no one single truth. Um, but I think, yeah. It's, it's funny too, so like if people come out, hey, I do artificial intelligence, then they really, um, probably most of the time, don't really know what to do themselves. So, okay, what did I do? I went to a bookshop and said, okay, let's buy a book about artificial intelligence. That's the way to go. After that, I'll know everything I need to know to build a great chatbot. <laughs> and I read it, 1,000, I don't know, 200 pages or something like that. And yeah, I was totally confused. I was, I, in the beginning, I thought, I have no idea afterwards, I knew I had no idea. Um, but okay, don't panic. You still have a goal in front of you. Um, it can be made, it can be done. So let's let's start simple. Yeah? Let's not get the complicated AI stuff. Let's move that away for a moment. What can we do? So, I mean, 
you want the chatbot, if you, the user says something, or tell it or whatever, you want the chatbot to answer. And so that's this classical interaction that you would have in chat. So if a user says something, you want an output. So what's the simplest version of how that can be accomplished? Well, read user input, check. <laughs> if what you expected is what the input is, and just reply with the static term. Looks incredibly simple. Some of you laugh because like, are you kidding me? That cannot be. But even today, a lot of chatbots are built exactly that way. Just because it's a chat window, or even if it's like Alexa talking to you, those people who build the skills, or features, or chatbots, or ones or whatever, most of it is just that. And it's not bad. I mean, it, after work, it has to work, right? I mean, there can be super fancy technology, there can be super simple technology. If the result is the same, apart from the sexiness of architecture, what's the game? Uh, so this is encouraging you. Um, although it looks super simple, sometimes if it's reaching the goal, it's just good enough. Uh, but I had a different opinion about that. I, I thought if I show anyone this code here, uh, people would laugh at me and be like, this is super simple. So that's why I thought, okay, now it has to be a different programming language. Let's like dig into my artificial intelligence book, what it has to say. And, and there was something called uh, a programming language uh, in logic. So Prolog. Uh, Prolog is a, it's a, it's a programming language uh, that is completely different to Java, C Sharp, or anything else that you would see these days. It uh, works completely different. This logical analysis of uh, different data. Um, invented in the 70s and probably died in the 90s. I mean, it's still around, but <laughs> it's really nobody uses it. But I said, okay, well, 2006, or this is what I'm going to use because um, that will lead me to a great chatbot. Just because, I mean, programming logic already says it's logic, and, and therefore building a chatbot is I mean, clear that that is the way to go. Um, so I tried to find examples from back in the day. I, I couldn't, that's why I copy pasted something from Wikipedia, but more or less, this is how it looks like. And I said, well, this is cool, because if I show this to people, they think I'm a genius. <laughs> and, well, it's complicated. I mean, it's, it's really interesting way of, of doing logic or logical structures. So I encourage you to look into either product or list just for the sake of doing it. Because it's a completely, it will frame your mind or wire it in a completely different way. Because this, this classical structure of programming from JavaScript, Java, C or whatever you do, this is a completely different approach, and I think it, it sort of taught me certain things that I would have learned out of this. <coughs> so that's how I started out. But soon I discovered, first of all, it's very complicated. Second of all, it's really hard to find other people who know it and can help you do it. And it's also not very efficient, and it doesn't even know multi-threading and this kind of thing because it's from the 70s, and in the 70s nobody knew what multi-threading would be. So then I said, okay, yeah, well, product might be not the last answer. I gotta mix it with a little bit of Java to make it more performant. And the longer uh, my journey took, the more I understood that whatever Prolog uh, has is uh, nice, but really it's much more effective to just do everything in Java. Uh, not saying that it didn't taught me, but a lot of inspiration that I took from Prolog, I could actually use the same way in Java. So basically algorithms, the way to analyze things. Um, but I just sort of recoded it in Java because, first of all, I was more familiar with it. It was more popular and much more state of the art. But it would be that exotic or complicated to accomplish a goal. Sometimes with the most simple tools, you can accomplish the very same thing. However, that doesn't mean you shouldn't look into it because it's, again, a different way of thinking, a different way of approaching things. And it can just uh, yeah, inspire you in a way uh, that will allow you to solve problems very differently than you would have solved them. So far, too good. The next problem. There's an endless amount of possibilities what a user can ask. So in the chat for development, what you do is basically prepare user input. So uh, that could be either just thinking about what could a user say and in different variations of it, and then sort of preparing uh, what the answer is. So some of you might be dealing with deep learning neural networks, but even they get data. They have to train their models. So, like this uh, 
artificial intelligence that has no idea about anything and all of a sudden can answer everything, that's really not true. It, you always have to pre-feed data. It's the same with human beings, right? I mean, a, a child doesn't know anything until you start teaching it something. And pretty much the same with computers, although it's a bit different. So, very simple example, greeting. So that's something in chatbot that happens quite often at the beginning. The bot greets a user or you greets a bot one way or the other. And you would like to sort of make sure that works. So there are multiple ways on how to read one. This is just English and just three of, I don't know, 15 common terms. Um, you could just do like the code example before, if else, if else, if else, and just depending on whatever the user says, and then just link it to the output. Uh, but the code gets like this, and yeah, it's really inefficient, and yeah, it's, it's very clear at some point that that's not the way to go if you already need like this line of code for just 15 reading phrases and you don't really have the functional pro uh, prototype. It's just, yeah, just sort of the, the very first chat for user interaction. So that cannot be it. But remember, there was Prolog, and in Prolog I learned something that a terminology that was called expressions. Expressions, at least the way I translated it then later into chat for development, is the idea of representing um, some knowledge with something else. So basically, uh, the idea to make it less abstract in chatbot development is how about if I can translate a user input first into its meaning and then continue with that instead of sort of using the user input all the way to the end and dealing with it and all the different places in the program. So let me whether tell or hi or good afternoon or good evening, it's sort of a greeting. You could argue that a good evening or good afternoon is a different meaning in a sense because it sort of also applies a time frame to it. But um, if, if you're not after what time he's talking about, if you're only after, hey, I want to know if he's greeting me or not, then reduction or simplicity like this is just good enough. So the same with the third word. Uh, so I'm videotaped and I don't want to make people beat me, so that's what I'm not going to say. But this, all these kind of things you can basically just collect and simplify to the definition of it. Sometimes it has to be a bit more uh, information to the definition. But if, if you only want to react to it in a very simplistic way, then throw away all the information you don't need. And the same way as the other way around, as soon as you have the meaning of it, you can just easily connect it to an output, and all of a sudden, a code like this is all it is. So instead of linking user input to output, there's a step in between, which is called expressions these days. Some people would say intents. That might be a more familiar term. Again, same. <laughs> but it, it eases a lot of things. So. That is the third lesson. Reducing information to a minimum reduces the complexity. Maybe it's not relevant at the moment, but when you work with it at a later point, complexity gets enormous if you don't do these things. Um, I call it expressions, other people call it intent, but really everyone does the same. They all reduce because whatever a human says, there is so much information, subtle information involved in it, but you just cut it out. If, you don't, if you're not intent to use it, cut it out. But there might be another problem. And the next problem is what happens if a user doesn't say a word or a phrase, but maybe multiple words and multiple phrases that sort of might be related or not, but you want to react to both of them. Um, then linking expressions to output might be not enough anymore. How about that one? Somebody wants to ask for a weather, but in the nature is not that super friendly. And that's actually something that is super common. Like people love to insult chatbots. So like when I look at conversations, the, the most often is either insult, asking for drugs, asking for girls, if it's men. Um, these kind of things are like 80% of all the conversation the, the chatbot has with human beings. Um, I guess it's out of curiosity. Can it react to it? What will it say? Um, but if you say, I don't understand you, then people just leave and say, ah, oh, this is stupid. So you actually have to deal with these kind of things in one way or the other. So w what can we do with it? So at some point I realized when I'm sort of out of ideas of what I can do, 
I might just turn to a model that I can look from, and that is humans. So what would human beings do? And that's really cool with chatbots because you actually have real life examples that sort of you can look at and say, okay, how would they do it? And you just copy from that. Uh, a re really rare situation that in many other situations you, have, you don't have or can't do. So somehow you need to make a decision. At some point when you understood or you believe you understood what the user wants or said, you need to make decisions on how to continue. Um, so in order to make decisions, you sort of need a uh, new layer in between this entire process we're looking at. So instead of linking expressions directly to an output, what we did before, uh, so in the, in the second phase, um, there needs to be one step before, and that is applying rules. So the user says something, we interpreted it into expressions or meaning or intents or whatever you want to call it. And as soon as you have it, now we need to make decisions. Uh, and there are many ways on how you can make decisions, but more or less it's everything sort of a rule thing. So there are the state machines, the typical rules, if else. There's the more advanced thing, neural network things, which in the end also have sort of if else, but just more advanced and with more data easier to handle. But again, that's sort of the thing that you need to apply in order to create the flexibility and also have the possibility to react differently depending on what kind of data or information user gives you. So, okay, now we have four layers. We have the user input, we're translating into a meaning, which I call expressions. Then we have rules, I call the behavior rules because it's sort of the behavior of the chatbot um, that we're looking at, and that should trigger a user output. So, looking at that in a more structured way, uh, these are the four layers. And it might be much more layers, depending on what you want to do, but this is sort of the, the minimum to make something reasonable that can be very powerful depending on how much time you use in order to build a chatbot. Um, so if the input and sort of there are two parts in it that are interesting, I mean, there, there's like show me and the, and some of you might ask, okay, what about these words? Uh, but once again, if you're not intent to use them, if they don't give you value apart from what else is there, why bother? At the beginning I thought, hey, maybe grammatical parsing and, and like really understanding how the structure of a sentence is will sort of lead me to the goal. But in the end, you might be able to parse a sentence and say, well, it's grammatically perfect, but what do you gain from it? What kind of decision you'll make? You end up making decision based on the main spots in the sentence. And the main spots in that case is uh, weather and the insult. So you have two expressions. In that case, I call it four letter words. In English, it's very often four letters, which is very interesting. I don't know why it's a coincidence, I guess, but uh, like 90% of the insult words in English are four letters. And there is ask for weather. So what would you do? Um, you would have rules that sort of um, uh, listen to these expressions and check. So one is I want to fetch the weather. Because usually, I mean, you need to get the weather from, from somewhere, right? The chatbot will not know it just by, by chance. You will have to connect it to another system that actually knows the weather. So chatbots are not intelligent. Chatbots are really something very simple. And chatbots sort of are more kind of translators between human language and computer language. So whatever magic is going to go on, whatever skills, if you look at Alexa, there might be, it will always be a typical natural backend service that does something special, but it's just connected to the chatbot. I, I like to see it a little bit in a way as a, a front office in a, in, a, in a company. So a customer goes there and tells in their own words what they want, and then the person at the front desk would turn to the computer, does something, and then basically turn back and gives the answer. So what happens here, the front office sort of translate the natural language into what do I need to do in order to get that information, turning to technology, turning away from technology, translating again from whatever the technology is set to a language the user understands. And that's basically the same thing what a chatbot does. Not less, not more. So, but the lesson here is really don't be just reactive to what is said. Make active decisions. Um, just maybe one more example that, that illustrates that a little bit better. Imagine you would uh, build a chatbot for an airline, and it's about the online check-in. I'm, I'm sure uh, some of you have done it before. You usually can select the seat that you want to see it, uh, to sit at. And imagine someone says, I want to, it doesn't matter where I sit, as long as it's uh, not somewhere in the middle. 
It might be relevant what he wants, but it's much more relevant what is possible. Like if he's like last minute uh, seat selection and the only seats that are available are in the middle, he will react differently to that user compared to if uh, another seat would be available. So there might be other information apart from the user that plays a role on how you want to react. So even for that, it's very important to make active decisions based on all the information you have, what is the best way to react. And again, looking at human beings, my biggest inspiration when building chatbots, um, it's generally a smart thing to think actively what to do rather than just spit it out. And that's it. So yeah, 13 years later, um, I ended up with a chatbot framework that had a couple of iterations of programming. Uh, I've told you before, Prolog, a mixture of Prolog and Java. Ended up with Java. And at some point I decided I, I don't like this typical project-oriented thing and uh, this proprietary software that I can sell and all these kind of things. I, I like to share it with people so they can look at it, how it works. Um, they have the security if they use it. They, they will not be charged for it because they have the code for it. And um, it should be super simple to do. Um, so in the beginning, it was really just five lines of code. The, the code I showed you before, at least similar to it, was really one of the very, very first iterations I had. Um, 13 years later, things got a little bit more complex. You, you, you know, people like to get a bit of flexibility and do this and that, and from one to 10 to 100 to 1,000 different things. And eventually, uh, yeah, you get to a bit bigger um, code repository. But that should not disencourage you. It's simply cooking with water. It's really, after all, just simple code. There's no magic behind it. Uh, it's just the way you structure it and the way uh, the architecture is built. Um, 10 years, so for those of you who would think, wow, 2006, 2019, this guy can't calculate. Well, I had a break in between from three years where I moved away from chatbots and into media. And then when things became popular, I moved back again. That's why it's only 10 years and not 13. Um, four development iterations from scratch because at some point I realized, well, I did something that w I thought was good and then I gained new knowledge and then I realized, well, it's not so good and I need to start from scratch. And even that is totally fine. You can't always have the answers in the beginning that you have in the end. It's really the, the progress and the process you have, the way you go, the steps you make that teach you new things, new things that you will see. So. Um, don't hold too tight on things you have done if you see that there are other ways which you can accomplish things much better. And even throwing stuff away doesn't mean you start from zero because you have so many ideas uh, that you can do it. You maybe can even uh, recycle some of the code patterns you have and do it newly. Uh, but just like don't stick to something just because you did it. Uh, much more often it's really reasonable to start from scratch or Try a completely different angle. Sometimes you will end up with a mixture of both. So the philosophy after so many years is really uh, flexibility is king. Because in chatbot development, there are so many different ways. You can first level support where you have uh, people describing their whole life stories, what's wrong and stuff like that. And you need sort of to figure out what's really wrong. Then you have the shopping experiences where a chatbot might tell you what smartphone is the best one for you. Uh, it could be education where people either connect people together or sort of teach you. Um, there are many various ways and with each way you have the, the complicated aspects of it. So flexibility is very important. Then structure reusability. Um, when I built the first chatbot, everything was, I mean, I didn't even think about it. When, when I built the second one, it was clear well, I did some of that before. So you usually want to have greetings available. Greetings will some, be something that the chatbot always should have. But once you mastered it once, why would you do it from scratch again? So very soon I discovered, okay, a lot of things I did with the chatbot once, I can just reuse for another, for another way. And it might be that, um, that I want to react differently. The chatbot might have a different personality. So one time it should be more formal, the other time it should be more cool. But then again, the user inputs that a user might say, so hello, hi, good evening, are the same. So even if the chatbot communicates very differently, the understanding of what a user will say will stay the same. So 
I mean, I think that doesn't apply only for chatbots. That's something worthwhile for many areas, especially in computer science, reusability of things. Um, but it's very much the same in chatbots. And performance efficiency. So when I started, I started on a single core machine that was super slow and um, one query, so user entered something and until the output came out, it took like 30 seconds, which was horrible. Um, but still, you know, like these days, computers are much faster and that's not of a problem. But then again, if you have hundreds or even thousands or even millions of people, performance becomes a thing again. Um, so, so that is something uh, that was always important to me because, yeah, people don't like to wait about stuff especially these days when you say something, even like on WhatsApp these days, right? You write someone and the person doesn't answer in five minutes, you go nuts, like what the fuck? Whew, almost, no beeping. So, some examples in action to understand sort of how that goes. And I'm gonna use the weather example because it's a little bit more complicated than only hello, hello, uh, but it's still uh, simple enough sort of to cover it in that lecture. So. What's the weather? And I'm gonna skip the part of what other possibilities there are of uh, asking for weather. There are many, but for the sake of simplicity, let's stick to only that one. So um, that might be not good enough to give an answer. Because what's the weather? Well, what would I as a human being ask? Like, from which city? Huh? Because the weather in, I don't know, Rio de Janeiro is different than in Vienna or New York City. So. We need to first actually ask for more information to fulfill the user's request. So usually I do this with Vienna because I'm from Austria, but in the morning I realized it might be cool to just do Krakow and do real life examples. So I assume the user says Krakow. And um, the chatbot should answer then what the actual thing is. So um, ideally, after I understood which city we want, we go to a weather service with the chatbot and say, hey, give me the weather about this, and they give all kinds of data. And from these all kinds of data, we pick what we want, which is sort of the, uh, how the sky looks like. Is it clear, cloudy, sunny, and the temperature. Um, but how does that work? And once again, it's really the same thing that I just said before, the different layers, um, but a little bit more complex. So there is the first thing, which is called a parser. That is the translation of meaning from user inputs to expressions. That's usually called in technical terminologies parsing. So you parse something and sort of extract something out of it. Then you have the behavior that are the rules. And there is one more thing which we didn't discuss, but I mentioned it. There is an API connector. So at some point you will need to connect to a backend service to actually be able to get the data you're looking for. Otherwise you could only hard code data into it and that doesn't make sense because for weather you actually want the current weather information and not something predefined. And then you have the output. Because How they work? Yeah, okay. So eventually if you got uh, the weather information, you actually need a way to communicate it to the user, otherwise the chatbot knows it, but the user doesn't and you sort of miss the actual purpose. So the way it goes, user input goes into parser, parser comes out with the meaning. Um, the meaning goes to the rules, and in the rules we decide what we do with the meaning. So we probably have not just one rule, but many rules that depending on whatever the meaning was, makes a decision. Um, then the rules sort of trigger actions. Because again, looking at human beings, if you made a decision, um, after decision usually follows an action. You want to do something. It could be do nothing, but some, I mean, doing nothing is also something, right? So something will be triggered um, after you made an active decision. And actually, um, you have then an action that also will trigger, that will trigger two things. One is uh, actually going to the API connector and the other uh, saying an output and then the bot reply. So let's make this with a more concrete example. Um, user said, what's the weather? That's the user input. The meaning of it is the current weather. Then again, um, that, might, that is something I got from Prolog, so that was the reason why I really loved uh, working with it and getting the inspiration from it. It's called an expression, and the idea is basically that 
everything in parentheses is basically the actual meaning and everything out of it is sort of the predicate. So let's say the semantic meaning of it, at least that's the, the interpretation of how I use it and the simplification of it. So you know you want to trigger something and in that case it's the current weather. So the behavior rules come up with actions. In that case we need two different actions. We need to actually turn to the computer and chatbot case turn to that API and in the API we're going to look for uh, data, data based on the user input. But then again it's not enough, uh, after we got the data we actually need to put it into an answer. So the fetch weather, the one action is really only made for looking data up and the second action which is current weather is actually uh, creating that output. So even output creation is very often uh, thought to be super complex, you can make major, again, AI algorithms that sort of uh, generate you awesome answer answers. Um, I did that, I wasted a couple of years with it. In the end, there are not endless amounts of possibilities how you can answer to something. Actually, there are very little amounts. For each individual concrete situation you have, there might be one, two, three, four, maybe five ways of saying it. But that's about it. So then common sense, if there are only four to five different ways of saying something, why would I invest five years to build a super complex algorithm if I just can sort of predefine sentences and just fill them with values? Again, it's almost too simple to be taken serious. You might be, oh, that's boring, that cannot be artificial intelligence. But yeah, that's how things work. And why not do it a simple way if that is just good enough? So yeah, the two things that uh, were important in the user input were the weather and the location. And with these, we were able to sort of satisfy uh, the user's input. Um, so again, this very thing that I built here and called expressions and rules and stuff like that, if you deal with Alexa or anything else, in Alexa it's called skills. Once again, different name, same thing. Um, but yeah, it could be very simple. And more or less, every single chatbot, every single function or skill of a chatbot is built that way. You have an interpretation of what a user says. You make an active decision of what you want to do. You maybe involve different technolo technologies to get that information and you react to it and tell the user that you did it. That's all the magic. So if you came here today thinking about, wow, this is going to be super artificial and complicated, um, sorry, it's really that simple. So if you want 99 more problems that a developer will love, check out the open source framework Eddy. You can find us in GitHub, Docker Hub. And yeah, if you would like to contribute to it, can drop me a message and we'll figure something out. So we have some more time, I think, for question and answers. So yeah, if you want to talk about anything, have questions, are curious about anything, or feel like I didn't mention something that, that was the only thing you came for, then let me know. So do we have any questions from the audience? You mentioned it was uh, initially a school project. I mean, did, did you choose the chatbot as your school project for some, or it was uh, predefined uh, so that you should do a chatbot? Or was it uh, your decision to do it? Yes, it was a school project, and no, I didn't have to do it. Actually, back in the days, like I told my teacher, hey, chatbot, and he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, you know the thing that can communicate with a human being. So um, I actually just had the idea, and I wanted to do it, and I had to... Turn it on and off again, it works. <laughs> Is it Windows, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so basically, that was the thing. I just had an idea, and they in the beginning told me uh, that's something I cannot accomplish because like there is the MIT and Stanford working on these kind of things and why would somebody young as me with no experience can do it and I was just fighting for it, argumenting for it that it's sort of the learning process and even if I can't achieve it it still makes sense to go that way and yeah eventually it took me a long time to get something that actually worked pretty well um, 
but I just fought for it and did it and yeah, spent nights and nights and many, many hours, many, many hours and hours, but it was worthwhile because I learned a lot, so yeah. Okay, any other question? No. Uh, the, the question is, uh, do you keep track of the uh, whole conversation? I mean, the conversation about the weather, uh, if the user later asks, what about win? So the previous conversation was about the weather. Actually, you could have. Yeah, so basically what you're referring to, so the question is uh, whether basically context is relevant in other parts of the conversation. So yes, the entire conversation will be stored. And in the rules, you can always check for what has been said before. You can also store away different kind of information. So if he said Vienna, Krakow, whatever, then that might be an information that is quite value. Because the next time he asks for the weather, you can just ask him, hey, is it you want to have the weather about Krakow again? And then you just do it. But once again, you have to actually implement that logic to do that. So the tools that are available will really allow to do it, but it will be no magic that just does it for you. So yes, uh, context is relevant, you should do it, um, but you always have to do this extra step and that's why chatbot development actually takes a lot of time because you always have to uh, implement this mechanism in order to be there. Um, you mentioned that you are using Java and the Prolog, right? And Prolog is a strongly logic-based language uh, are you using um, uh, functional uh, languages or maybe functional features like lambdas, uh, higher order functions, or et cetera, et cetera? So, uh, I mean, functional programming is something that was available back in the days, but by far not that popular or supported than it is these days. Um, Java, for instance, supports lambda to some degree. So yes, they're, since it's like the newest version, Java 11 to Java 12, um, just came out recently. Um, I use Lambda as well. It's the, the entire program is not that totally function programming oriented. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it can be done. I mean, I, I don't see any way why it couldn't be done. Um, I think there are many ways of solving the very same problems. I doubt that functional problem makes it much more easier because you, in the end, still have the same things that you need to accomplish and the same amount of uh, things that you need to handle. So. Um, it's like today I probably would do it because it's the cool thing to do. <laughs> um, but then again, what makes you the most effective, what is the most easiest to maintain um, is probably the thing you choose, should choose for. And if uh, functional programming can give you inspiration, that's great. Um, but it's not prerequisite for actually making a chatbot work. Okay, I think we have some time for two more questions. And how do you connect Prolog and Java? It's some interface between, or you use these two languages independently? Um, that was a question I had to ask myself too when I decided I want to use a little bit of Java, like how can you connect these things? And um, usually you will need to have sort of a bridge in between. I choose a Prolog um, interpreter that was actually written in Java and that had the plus functionality, I think it was called TU Prolog, which is a Prolog implementation from a university in Italy. Uh, Try again. <laughs> So, uh, and basically this Prolog interpreter allowed to call functions in Java and actually return it in Prolog and use it within Prolog, which made it super easy. But usually you will have to have one way or the other. These days probably you could just do it over an HTTP interface sending things back and forth. Um, but yes, it's usually a problem if two languages have no interoperability, you will have to either program it yourself or find something that works with it. Uh, but it definitely uh, like kept me busy for half a year figuring out how that can work. Okay, do we have any other question? Hmm. Okay, so thank you, Gregor, for a great lecture.